I've talked about GPT Engineer on my channel before. The video received a lot of heated reactions, ranging from this is a completely useless tool to we're all going to be replaced to why the hell does your keyboard sound like you're shaking maracas? Wait. Nope. You need to get your maracas checked out by a maracacologist because apparently they sound like a keyboard. Anyway, I don't think we're all going to be replaced anytime soon. But already right now, I don't think it's a useless tool either. I've actually found it very useful for a specific type of job. But before I talk about that, let's take another look at what GPT Engineer actually is and what you can do with it and what's not so good about it. Let's get this party started. Like I showed in my last video, GPT Engineer allows you to write a prompt and then basically let it build the application for you. And before it can do that, it will typically ask you a number of clarifying questions. In the previous video, I only had access to GPT 3.5, but now I also have GPT 4. So let's recreate that same application and see what the difference is. So I'm going to use the same prompt for this particular test application. In this case, I want to create an API that generates random IDs. And we have a couple of IDs that we want to support, UID, object ID, numeric IDs, random string IDs, and uh, WEP keys. And then you should be able to generate a single ID or a batch of up to a thousand. So I've already exported my OpenAI API key. Uh, you can also define that as an environment variable and then it's going to work. Um, but what I'm simply going to do is call GPT engineer on the folder. GE test and that contains my prompt. So now it asks for a few clarifying questions. So the first question is, can you specify the exact format and length requirements for each type of uh, UUID? Object ID, numeric ID, random string IDs and the uh, keys. And this actually also shows, also some of you mentioned that in a comment of the previous video, that in order to use something like GPT Engineer, you actually need to know what all of this stuff means. Because if you don't know what a WEP key is, well, how are you going to specify the length and requirements, right? So let's say we want WP keys should be uh, 256 bits. Uh, we want random uh, string and numeric IDs should have uh, 32 characters. I don't know, I'm just randomly saying something. And I think the UID and object ID should follow uh, the standard format because I think they're actually standardized. Remaining unclear areas, so it's going to ask another question. Clarify if the batch of IDs should be of the same type or they can be a mix of different types. Batch should always be of the same type. Now the next question is, could you please explain the process for requesting a single ID versus a batch of IDs? So a single ID should be generated by just doing a single get request and you should be able to get a batch of IDs by providing the ID type and the batch size. Maximum thousand. There we go. So how should the system respond if the request for a batch size exceeds the maximum limit of a thousand? In that case, the system should respond with a 4000 HTTP error. And now GPT Engineer creates the classes, functions and methods for us using GPT-4. Now it's done, it asks us if we want to execute the code and yes, we do want to do that. And actually now we run into a problem that the generated code didn't run, so I'm just going to press no here. This is actually a problem of using an older version of Flask. So I've updated the requirements file to move this to a more recent version of Flask. And now we're finally able to actually run this application. So here I have my web browser open and I've just created a UUID. So that actually works. So in this case, the code didn't initially run at a fix some requirements issue. And that's something you're going to encounter with GPT Engineer when you actually start using it. So this was created with GPT-4. Let's take a look at what the code actually looks like. So there's an ID generator that does the actual ID generating tasks. So uh, it simply is a class that has a bunch of methods to generate the various types of IDs. Then we have a batch generator that has a generate batch method 
that gets an ID type and a batch size and then simply uses the ID generator to generate those IDs. In particular, I think the problem with this is that the generate batch method now is has hard-coded dependencies on the specific types of IDs that are being generated. So I think a better option would have been that this thing here was defined in this file and that this simply provided the mapping from that dictionary, from the keys in the dictionary to the actual uh, functions. There's no need for a class here either. So that's how I would set it up differently. And then generate batch could simply call the specific function by accessing the dictionary. So it wouldn't be dependent on uh, specific types of ID generators. So the design is not ideal, but at least it split up this operation part from uh, the actual app.pi, which is the route. And it did, in that sense, a pretty decent job in that it returns a JSON string. It also has a try accept. So if there is a key error, then it's going to return a 400 status message. So it actually did what we asked it to do. Now let's see what happens if we use GPT 3.5 instead of GPT 4. Before I dive into that, let's talk about how you would actually host an application like this in the cloud. And for that, Hostinger, the sponsor of today's video, is a really good and affordable choice. Hostinger offers a VPS service that has really everything that you need. You get full root access, a dedicated IP address, they have multiple operating systems, including, of course, different distributions of Linux that you can choose from, and much, much more. Hostinger's VPS service utilizes powerful hardware, including NVMe SSDs and AMD Epic processors. And with KVM virtualization, your app or website can benefit from separate resources, leading to improved performance and stability. The KVM2 plan is a really great place to start at only $7.99 per month. And when you select the plan, make sure that you add the coupon code Iron codes, and then you're going to get an additional 10% off. So don't forget to do that. Once you've selected your VPS plan, it's really easy to set up in Hostinger's user interface. You start by selecting a location for your VPS. So I'm based in the Netherlands, so let's select the Netherlands. And then you can choose what kind of VPS you want. So do you want an OS with a control panel, just a plain operating system, or do you want to use a content management system like WordPress? I'm going to pick OS with control panel because for me that's a bit easier to manage. So I'm going to pick Ubuntu, then simply click continue. Now we can create a panel password. We also pick a root password. If you want to access your server remotely, you can already provide an SSH key right in the setup process. So here's my setup and now we simply click finish setup and in a few minutes your VPS is ready to go. Especially when you've already created your tool with, for example, GPT Engineer, then now it just takes a few steps to create a server and host your application on that. Hostinger offers 24 seven support, so you're never going to feel lost. They have over 2 million users that use their website service. And on top of that, they have a 30 day money back guarantee. So there's no risk to you. Click the link in the description of this video to get started with Hostinger. And don't forget to apply the Ion codes coupon code for an extra 10% off. Thanks to Hostinger for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to GPT Engineer. So I still get questions about the areas that need clarification. There's actually more questions here than in the previous set that might be just happening by chance. We'd have to look at multiple projects to see if this really makes a difference. But we also get one question with all the areas and then we need to answer everything all at once. So the experience is a bit different. So I've now provided answers to the questions and now it's generating the code for this particular application, but this time using GPT 3.5. So now it created the server and actually it also works. So it creates a bunch of IDs. And let's try something else. So if we do, if we want 500 UUIDs, then that also works. And let's try something else. Let's say we want an object ID that also works. You see that oh, it looks a bit weird. Uh, you see that it actually creates incremental object IDs. This sort of makes sense because often when you're using a database and you want to create incremental object ID values, it might be nice to actually have some control over that. I did define that in the scope of this project, so it doesn't really matter. But the basics of the application work. So in this case, 
Strangely enough, it seemed that the GPT-4 version actually didn't run initially, but that was mainly due to a requirement issue that was easily fixed. But I do think it's interesting to take a look at the difference in the type of code that GPT-3.5 versus GPT-4 generates, because there are quite a few differences, especially in terms of design. In the GPT-4 version, we have this class ID generator, which has all the ID generating stuff, and we have a batch generator class, which deals with creating batches of IDs. So how does that look like in the GPT 3.5 version? So here we also have an ID generator, which is a class with static methods, which I actually kind of prefer over the GPT 4 version. And this has all the generate ID methods, but it also has a static method generate IDs that does the batching work. Now the design of this is honestly pretty horrible because there's like a lot of duplication. You see all these if else loops. This is like completely coupled with all of the different ID types. I think it also would make sense to turn ID type in an enumerated type and there's basically way too much duplication. I see that the main difference between GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 in this case is that at least GPT 4 sort of try to make this a bit simpler by introducing a dictionary. 3.5 didn't do that and it just generated a bunch of if else statements. So that's not great. I would definitely have to spend quite a bit of time refactoring this code and making it clean. I would probably re remove this and do it in a completely different way by just using a sort of dictionary with registration methods uh, mechanism. So it's a starting point, but it would still require me to do quite a bit of work. Also, what I noticed is that I got more clarifying questions with 3.5 versus GPT-4. So it means I also spent more time with GPT-3.5 to actually make sure that it generates something that is actually useful versus GPT-4, which seemed to pose less questions and come up with a solution quicker. Now, the other thing is, of course, that, well, GPT-4 is more expensive and it takes more time to generate the code versus GPT 3.5, which is quite a bit faster. So it's also kind of a trade-off between, okay, how much time do you want to spend waiting for the code to be generated or do you need something really fast and then just spend a bit of time modifying the code? Because in this case, I would have had to modify the code in any case for both GPT 4 and the GPT 3.5 generated code. So what do you think? Do you prefer performance? quality over speed uh, or the other way around? Let me know what you think in the comments. Now, how is GPT Engineer actually useful? Some things that it definitely can't do is take your existing code base and work on that. And that also means that once you generate the code, I don't think there's an easy way to actually update or modify it. It does keep track of the prompts, so you can actually let it like replace the code that you created, but I haven't figured out a way to iterate over the code and improve it over time. But as far as I see in the GitHub repository, they are working on adding these types of features uh, because that basically comes down to working with an existing code base and then use that to add improvements. I think being able to work with existing code is a really important feature to add to tools like this because that's what most developers will be doing most of the time. You won't always generate new applications from scratch. In fact, that's quite rare in my experience. That also means that it's still a valuable skill to have to know how to review and improve and refactor code. And if you want to become better at that, you should check out my free workshop on code diagnosis. You can get access to that by going to ironlotcodes slash diagnosis. In this workshop, I teach you a three-factor framework that helps you identify design problems in existing code effectively and efficiently. It contains ton of useful advice and practical examples that you can apply right away to your own projects. So just go to iron.code slash diagnosis to sign up for free. I'll also put the link in the description of this video. So now you might say, okay, so if it doesn't really work with existing code, then what use is this actually? Well, one thing that I found it personally very helpful for is to quickly generate some boilerplate code. It's like, it's not perfect, right? But it's a pretty nice starting point. And there's a few things you can do to make that easier for you. One thing that you can do is actually be very explicit about what you want the application to be like. So in this case, I have a prompt where I specifically say, hey, I want a boilerplate backend API application. 
and I'm already supplying some information. So here, for example, this is an application to create, read, update, and delete users. A second thing that I'm doing is that I specifically indicate the technologies that I want to use. So by default, it's going to generate like a Flask application and perhaps I want to use Fast API because I prefer that framework over Flask. But I also mentioned SQL Alchemy and I mentioned a SQL Lite database and I even specify some details like it should have a single model user that has these following fields, right? A unique email, a name, and an ID. So now let's run GPT engineer on this particular boilerplate application. So it wants to know the specific version of fast API and SQL Alchemy, maximum length for the name and email fields, and a couple of other things. So again, it now tries to run the code, but it actually doesn't work. In order to get this working, I had to clean up some imports and install a missing Pydantic email validator package. So it's definitely not perfect. Well, that was like five minutes of work. And if I look at the code that it actually generated, it doesn't look that bad. You know, we have the operations layer, getting a user, creating a user, updating a user, so that's all there. We have the database bit, which is also correct. Then we have the models. So in this case, just the user model, which is also correct. So that's the ID, name, and email, just as I want it. So having this ready for me, and then I can just work with this, actually saves me a bunch of time. So even though it's not perfect, it still requires you to do some work, I do think it's a great starting point if you need a new project. Another thing to realize is that you don't necessarily always have to start a new project with this. Let's say you have an existing project, an existing API that you're already building out and you want to add some feature to it. This is actually what happened to me. And I wanted to have a feature where I could via my API get some information about some of the YouTube videos that I posted on my channel. So what I did is I created this prompt that you're seeing right here, just create a simple API using Fast API because my own API also uses Fast API and that allows me to get basic information about the YouTube video. So that created a YouTube service file which has a get video info method given a video ID and that uses PyTube, which actually I didn't hear of. So I also discovered a new library this way. And then I can use this code as a starting point to integrate it into my own API. So that's also how I've been actually using the tool. And actually the code that GPT Engineer generated for retrieving YouTube video data is something that I'm currently using in LearnTail, which is an AI quiz generator that I've been developing over the past weeks. If you want to try out the platform, simply go to learntail.com. You can join for free and generate quizzes about any topic that you like. If you want to learn more about how to build an application like LearnTail, how to set it up in the cloud, how to create an architecture that suits this type of application, you should definitely watch this video next because there I dive into the details. Thanks so much for watching and take care.